is called Ruby uh, as a social player. Uh, mm -hmm. And for example, Hope University, just down the road, uh, some of you may know them from Hope University, the only medical university in, in Europe, fully Catholic, fully Anglican. Um, I've, I've had the privilege of working there now, fully on the staff, for I'm in my 21st year. I was a student there in 1984 to 87 in my first degree there. Um, so it's, it's a privilege to come along with you today. I'm the head of uh, geography and environmental science at Liverpool Home. It's, a big, it's great to come along and uh, speak to you today. I've got, a, I've got quite a big weekend uh, this weekend because if anyone's available at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, you're very welcome to join us down in the cathedral because I'm being ordained as a permanent deacon. So it's my final day, <laughs> or I have a penultimate day before for ordination. So yeah, it's great to come. And part of my part of my ministry uh, uh, is, of course, uh, the environment. I'm a professional environmentalist, environmental geographer, specialised in, in coastal environments. So it's relevant to come and speak to you today. Um, it's somewhat of a challenge to tackle all of this in a short talk because they are huge issues. And I have to say, um, you know, it's, um, it's always quite a, a struggle to, to pitch this uh, appropriately. So I'm going to give it a shot and talk about this issue. Um, but if we start off, we think the first thing, the, the, the topic is really climate change. Now, um, is that our single focus? It's an interesting one to start off on. Um, it consumes a lot of my time, climate change, but is this the only thing that we're interested in? Well, it's certainly, we can definitely say that climate change is the most serious threat to humanity this century, without any doubt. That's it's the overarching, um, uh, it's the sort of damage that's hanging over us. Um, but it's important to note that it's not the only threat. Here you are, the Justice and Peace Commission. We are aware of the complexities and the challenges that we face in our world. Um, there are several other threats that can pose really, really big problems for us in the future. I'm going to touch upon some of these. I can't do all of them because it's so, it's, it's, uh, if I said it was complex, that wouldn't be true. It's, it's super complex. Okay. So we have to be aware that our, our climate change is the big issue. But there's lots and lots of other issues. But the thing is that if we get our, if we don't get our response to climate change right, then it'll magnify all these other problems, all these other threats. And there's a very, very real possibility, and I don't I think it's a, almost a certainty, that they can spiral out of control. So, of course we need to focus on climate change, but we need to be mindful there's lots of other threats, but we've got to get the climate change issue right, otherwise all those other threats are magnified. Okay, so what we're going to do in this talk, it's very interesting this, because I try to break it down, it's a complex topic, um, but I try to simplify it by trying to say, what are the issues that we're going to face? What is what to, to, in, a, in a thumbnail, and then um, what can be done to face these challenges and create a better world? And then I reflected on that second one in the last couple of days, and actually changed it because that sounds like it's somebody else's problem, somebody else needs to do it. So I said, what can we do about these challenges to create a better world? So perhaps that second one. Um, this one is much more appropriate because we have individual and collective responsibility. So here we go, I'm going to take you on a, a tour. Now it's the weekend and we're in the summer and we should all be bright and happy and I hope that I don't knock that happiness out of you too much because it's an awfully difficult topic to talk to even with my students. Uh, they kind of come away, some of them come away feeling a bit down, but let's not feel like that. Let's understand the issues and let's be hopeful about what we can do about this. Okay. So first of all, I think we need to appreciate 
that we are living in a changing world, a dynamic world. And there's nothing that we can do that will stop that. It's a fact. The world is a changing place. Um, I'm 53 this year, and my kids laugh at me when I um, talk to them about a world without mobile phones. Okay. I remember my first mobile phone it, uh, for work, I used to manage nature reserves up on the second coast. My first mobile phone was in a suitcase. I used to open it, pull an aerial up, and it had a, a handset with a carrying wire on it, and I just think it's hilarious. Okay. The world's changing, and the pace of change is getting ever faster. And you see people sitting around here with iPads and mobile phones and smartphones, information exchange is bigger. And we are a global village, Marshall Blackman's idea from the 60s. We really are a global village now. Pace of change, the world's dynamic. That's a fact. We need to change that. We need to move with it. And I'll make a couple of references to this. Um, at the start and the close of this talk, I can see some faces here in the, in the, in the audience. Maybe it's a congregation that that's for tomorrow. Um, <laughs> that, um, that we, we are in the middle, and the Archdiocese in the middle of a synod, and I can see several people around who are deeply involved in that. And not only is the world changing, but also our church is changing as well. And we have to face up to the fact that it is changing. Business for both the world. The world is the church, and the church is the world. We, uh, we, have to, we have to embrace that change. Okay, let's start with population. Okay, this is an interesting slide because every time I, I do talks like this, I use this thing, I have to update it all the time. And there's a, there's a website that tells you what the essence of the current population of the world is. Earlier this week, uh, this week on the 2nd of July, at just about quarter past three in the afternoon, I took a screenshot of the uh, world's population. Seven billion, I suppose it's a big number, right, I can't even say that, right? <laughs> it's a big, big number. Just take mindful of this, what that number is. And I'm just going to go onto the website right now. Right now, as we're sitting here, this is a fact. World population is changing, and there it is. You can sit there for hours watching this. <laughs> so let's just be mindful. Let's just say what we're up to there. Seven, two, five, four, well, five hundred. Five hundred. When I took that screenshot, it was less than that. We'll come back to this. That's, a bit, that's just a reality. These are facts. I, I last did a talk like this in November. And in November, I had it 7.5 billion. And this week, I was updated to 7.7 .7 billion. I remember as a student in the 1980s, I was an environmental student talking about 5 billion on the planet. Fact. Okay. And we projected to grow to more than 10 billion in the not too distant future. So that's twice as many people on the planet from when I was an undergraduate student down the road in what's now local Oak University in the mid 80s. Twice as many. Now, what we can see in historical growth from, we can see it from 1 billion. Um, in 1800 to 7 billion in the, of the year 2000. Um, and we can, there was actually a maximum growth rate in the 1900s. Uh, and we're going to leave this, this an ethical and moral issue here next, but we can see changes in the growth rate of the, uh, of the, of the world's population. Um, and what we're seeing actually is a decline in the growth rate. But there are more people. So although the growth rate has gone down, there are more people. And if you look at the demographics, it's a younger population. Okay, so there are issues like access to blood birth control and population is ethical and moral issues. I'm not going to go there. But what we can do, we can look at facts. And there's some facts about the world population. We can see this 
uh, big growth rate in, in, the, in the 1900s. And this big high growth rate, it was 2.1%. And the growth rate has gone down now, presently projected to go down to 0.1%. And yet, the numbers of people on this earth are going up. And in the not too distant future, we'll have 11, 10, 11 billion people on this planet. Twice as many people than when I was an 18 year old. Fact. <coughs> Here's that chart again that I did on the second. Let's just see where we're up to. <laughs> on that. Oh my goodness, it's still going up as we're sitting here. So, the world is a changing place. It's changing rapidly. One of the big factors is that there's more and more people on this planet. How we react to that is a major question for us. You'll have heard about the greenhouse effect, I'm sure. It became very popular in the 80s, it was, it was popularized then. But actually, the greenhouse effect has been known for well over 100 years scientifically. Um, and basically, what it is, we have a blanket of gases, greenhouse gases, GHGs, greenhouse gases, a basket of them, a whole collection of gases that envelop the air and keep it warm like a blanket. The problem is that throughout, through that, that blanket has been getting thicker and thicker. It's a bit like having. Um, your winter duvet on in the summer, right? Or if you still like, if you still have your slightly blankets on top of you when it's 30 degrees, 70 degrees, right? So we're putting a thicker and thicker blanket and heating up the air. That's, and that's a, that's a big issue. It's, the, 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 that blanket's got thicker over the years. So where are these extra gases, greenhouse gases, come from? Well, there's a many, many different sources, but the major sources are our use of fossil fuels and through burning wood and through deforestation. So let's even boil it down. They're the major sources, and there's other sources as well. But basically, it's human activity. That's created a thicker blanket. That's what's created a thicker blanket. Us. Not them. Us. We're the ones who have done that, particularly us in the developed world. And this is a nice little thing to think about when we talk about the developed world. The inequalities are something you look this one up on called the carbon map. Now, I'm just going to go on and this again for this. This is really neat, I think, anyway. So there's a pretty standard projection of the Earth, you may realise and be able to appreciate that, where we can see. You know, the areas of the continents, Africa. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> oh, there we go. I'll have to use this. Maps. There's Af off Africa, Asia, you know, go to Europe, North America, South America. And it looks fairly, you know, as we might say, we call it a Mercator, almost, almost a Mercator projection. But let's look at the size of these areas according to different factors along the top. And as I click on these, it makes them larger or smaller according to how important or big or they are. So for instance, if I click on population, watch it change. So we can see big population over in Asia. Look at wealth. Let's look at emissions. This is carbon emissions, climate change, where they come from. Consumption, people at risk, oh dear, sea level, <coughs> and then last of all, poverty. If you're particularly concerned about some imagine you're going to preach it to converted here in just as a peace group, well have a play around on that carbon matter. I would say ours then was full, but maybe it's performed, but it's least informative. And we should think about the things. So there's a whole basket of greenhouse gases, but the one that we're, one, one of the ones that we're really concerned about 
is carbon dioxide. Okay. Well, we measure it by something called parts per million ppm. Right. Half a million. And again, one of the last talks I told you in November, I took a, a, a screen grab go over of the count, 408 part, parts per million in November 2018. I updated it for this talk. 413. Right. It's not an upward trend. Okay. So what we can see, okay, the carbon varies you know, according to outputs and things, but what we can see is an upward trend in our carbon dioxide emissions. So it's just not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. All this increase in greenhouse gases heats us up. The blanket gets thicker. Greenhouse effect. Like put your, you've got your winter duvet on in the summer, okay? And we can see time over here, go back to 1000, 1066, how old you know, within the concrete, etc. And then moving up, we hit the Industrial Revolution, right? There's a little lag time, right? Because the atmosphere has to respond. And then we see in the 20th century this dramatic upward curve, and we call this the hockey stick curve, right. and that's our problem, that's our problem, rapid increase, there's a lag time and a rapid increase, this is what we're concerned about. <clears throat> so, what does all this mean, these are scientific facts and figures, what does all this really mean to us? Um, well. It means that we're going to see much more land use pressure um, with, uh, as a human race, we're going to become more, much more uh, uh, an urban species, right? Much more an urban species. The future of humanity probably sits in the management of, you know, of good, uh, sustainable cities. That's a huge challenge for us. Everything that goes with it. Food resources, water resources, transport, uh, energy, um, all those things. But then also the future of agriculture as well, because we're going to feed people. And we'll be able to, and, and, and land is going to change with climate change. In fact, I, I do a lot of work, as Tony and John know, on salmon dunes and coastal environments, which is a couple of years ago, I had a big conference on coastal dune forestry. We may have gone up to the Squirrel Reserve and things up on the south of the coast to manage all of that. And we're looking at the future projections. What trees should we be planting now for a hundred years' time? In 100 years time, here, we'll have the um, climate of Bordeaux. And that might sound attractive, but that means that the plants and the animals and trees that we have now will be able to survive. Okay. So, with big land use pressures, and of course then, there's going to be lots of pollution, because we're chucking up in the atmosphere greenhouse gases and pollutants through our everyday lives, through our everyday activities. Um, that's then going to cause all kinds of climate stresses. Um, in, we've, we've seen in the news recently about the heat wave in Europe, right? and I really am identifying this. It's not just anecdotal now, it's actually real scientific evidence of linking this to climate change and increasing stresses on this. We're seeing storm surges, changes in storm patterns, and I know from coastal work, I think it's hours on that if you want, if you want to. If you're uh, anyone has insomnia, <coughs> there. Um, and then ice sheet melt, and then as a result, sea level rise. And that's massive. That's what we'll talk about in a minute. Now, if I just take land use pressure, this is a concept of a, a conceptual model. Please don't be put off by this idea, but let's just talk you through this for a moment. I think I've got land use pressure here. So, we have climate change and land use coverage changes. So, for instance, we deforest areas and we turn those forest areas over to grazing to produce beef, McDonald's burgers, etc. So, it's a farm. That causes pollution. That, in a turn, puts pressure on the land. It's a negative feed, which is worse. The pollution then also creates climate stresses. Derived storm surges, that in itself puts pressure on the land. The climate stresses themselves 
cause the ice to melt. If the ice melts, we have relative sea change, which then puts pressures on the land. That's the reality of it. This is what's happening. It's not about to happen. It has been happening, and it is happening, and it will continue to happen, no matter what we do. <coughs> Let's just take disforestation. It's a terribly cheery talk, isn't it? <laughs> Told you. Remember, hope. Keep hope. Remember, keep that there. Hope. Okay, let's talk about deforestation. Okay. There's a little graph we can see. In Western Europe, and Europe in general, if you look at the green, about seven, pre-1700 onwards, we chop down loads of our forest. In Britain, we chop down most of our forest five or six thousand years ago with the agricultural revolution. Okay? But we got rid of a lot of our forest you know, early days. And it's got you know, the, the, the still issues of conservation of temperate forests, but it's not much. If you look at tropical rainforests, which are in the news, and I've been for the last few decades, they say about deforestation in Amazonia, etc. It's not just in Amazonia. Also over in Asia as well, and the conversion of areas for palm oil and things like that. But we can see a dramatic rise from the late 19th century into the 20th century, where we were chopping out tropical rainforests. And maybe, you know, there was a big environmental movement. You remember the, the Rio Earth Summit <coughs> of Great Britain at that time, or the, the, the subsequent summits. And we have slightly reduced the amount of tropical rainforest being taken out. But let's not be fooled by this, because this is still huge. This is still huge. This is unsustainable. This is huge. And we've already taken out huge swathes of our temperate forest. So this is a big issue. Then if we look at the reasons why these, this, this deforestation is going on, I don't know if this is for ages, but a summary, right? Here's a summary where we can see deforestation pressures, and the red, everything, anything that's marked is bad, but the red are particularly bad. Particularly bad. Where's the red? The red's mainly down here, and it's in agriculture. We're converting forests to agriculture, feeding people, and largely the livestock. And largely to eat meat. So we eat meat. Of course, there's loads of other reasons, but this is the big one. So if we look at this, and again, I'm not putting any ethics up here, I'm putting facts, right, for scientific research. This is from the Wave Resources Institute, this is a ghost body, it's not bogus. Okay, so, animal versus plant-based farming. This it's basically, you can look at all these colours, but basically that's the impact, the environmental impact. The environmental impact of plant-based farming is relatively small. Look at the environmental impact of livestock. It's much larger, and particularly beef. Beef is madness. Sorry, that's, that's, that's a poor choice of words, let me retract that. Right. Um, it, it, it doesn't make sense to eat beef, right, ecologically. We have to have serious consideration about eating meat going forward, or the way that we produce meat, because the environmental impact of meat production is heavy. And some forms of meat production are particularly heavy and problematic. There we go. So, eating meat, question mark. I have been a vegetarian, I'm not now, I'm just a vegetarian between meals now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just think about beans for a moment. Very much in the news, the moment you've heard about bees, um, the problems with bees, issues with, with uh, um, uh, chemicals in the environment, and uh, debates about this, and you know, bees is much more popular, just well, an event just not long ago on Everton Brown and school kids out on the wildflowers there and the beekeepers out. Bees are really important. Bees are really, really important to our world economy, to our food production, because of their role as pollinators. We 
cannot remember how to write in the news. Um, but what are some of the, the facts and figures there? Pollinate are almost 90% of the flowering plants. 70% of the 124 Wales main crops, bees were a main pollinator. Key to provide us with food. Key to provide us a biodiverse environment. And that biodiverse environment is part of our weather's life, our wellness. Without bees, these numbers would begin to rapidly decline. Has anyone ever seen the bee movie that's taking the grandkids in? I took my kids to go and see it. So it's cartoon about bees going on strike because of poor conditions and the world falls to bits. It's a nice kids movie. If you get a chance to see it, do people go look to see the bee movie. Fun, really big, cutting message. Bees are suffering from climate change. The direct impacts, so altering the environment, we destroy the environment, I've heard that we do. Indirect impacts as well, because it changes the seasonality. And we're seeing that in this country. Earlier, you know, plants flowering earlier in the year, but the bees are not, the bees are not adapt, because bees can't adapt that quick to respond to that, and therefore their food sources are not available. Um, seven species of bees are now listed as endangered. That's a real concern, that's just a start. Okay, we've seen plenty of extinctions in the past. Things like classically the dodo, right? Um, the passenger pigeon, and the other that we used to do in the States, blackened the sky, we shot them all out, we nearly lost the, the buffalo, right? There's whole sad, loads and loads of sad stories, we lose and stuff all the time. It's not too late to do something about bees, and they're a really, really important cornerstone for, in our environment for us and for everything else. So we, there's a bit of hope. We can do something. But we have to realise that over the years we have extinction is part of the natural way of things. It's a fact. If we look through geological time, there's been five mass extinctions. Fact. This is because of asteroid impact. Great big volcanic type basaltic explosions and changes in climate, which caused particularly sea level <coughs> fall, so seas have disappeared. Right. That's happened in a fact over the years. And we can see it over millions of years one, two, three, four, five events. And in terms of the percentage of species, we've lost huge amounts of species in those natural events. Up to 96% of species on the earth wiped out. In, in, the, in, the, in one of those, in the Jurassic extinction event, was when the dinosaurs got their cards. Right? That's where the dinosaurs went. Fact. So we do have mass extinction events. There will be a sixth fact. We might be hit by an asteroid. Super volcano, somewhere like Yellowstone, won't make work to explode. I say to my students, I'll do sometimes on a Friday afternoon when we give this type of lecture, it might go off tonight. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Fact. There's not likely to be a dramatic fall or rise in sea level, because that's gradual. But the asteroid impact, nothing we can do about it. Super volcano going off, nothing we can do about it. It will happen again. It's part of the Earth, part of God's creation. Fact. Okay. But what we're seeing is a huge amount of modern extinctions. This is us. All kinds of anthropogenic things. What we're seeing now is an extinction rate of species that this planet has never, ever experienced before in scientific knowledge. And that's us. It's not an asteroid, it's not a super volcano, it's not a dramatic change in sea life. It's our actions. Our actions. We are changing habitats and species distribution. The web of life, we are changing. We're doing that. We're changing this. 
are we having a little mass of change in the belt? Well, in my opinion, the answer to that, of course, is yes. We're actually in that mass extinction event now. We're in the sixth mass extinction event through our actions, our present day actions and our historical actions. And that's, again, like hockey stick curve, there's more and more species being become extinct, habitats are under increasing pressure. And in addition to that, we might have a natural event. A volcano may go off, the asteroid, well, not, it will go off, so it's not may, it will, right? And the asteroid will hit. We don't know when they'll be. Could be tomorrow, could be today. Get the tea break. Right? Or it could be in a thousand years' time. We don't know when they are. But we are, our actions are leading us through a mass extinction event. So, what we have, I just put up a, 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 a diagram there of all the geological time over hundreds of millions of years the Cretaceous, the, Jura, the, the Jurassic, etc. There's a new, you may have heard of a new, still absolutely contested, idea of geological time that we call the Anthropocene. We're living in a new geological era. The new geological era of people, the Anthropocene, where our footprint on the, on the planet is now so heavy that it will be there in the geological record. Geo. So, I've got about three slides out, and I'll do it quite quickly, just as some very quick facts and things before I get to some take home points at the end. Um, so, what are these future climate projections? Well, there's a the low cost panel called the IPCC, it's a governmental panel on climate change. And uh, I'll discuss at the end about attitudes and beliefs, but let's say most um, rational people <laughs> believe that this, that this is a good. Um, I've got good opinions, right? Okay. So I'm, I'm taking this from some of the IPCC stuff, right? It's government of how we climate change. So it's very likely that things are going to get tougher for us. High degree of confidence in that. Hot extremes, heat waves, heavy precipitation events. Maybe we're, we're starting to experience that already. Yeah. So it's anecdotal, we're starting to link this now to climate change. And the, the models predict. Um, in other parts of the world, we're, we're, we're going to see tropical cyclones become much more intense. Remember that um, where the port were located on my car from that? Okay. Um, with larger peak wind speed and heavy precipitation, has anyone ever been caught in a tropical storm? My wife got stranded, she's worked, my wife's lecturing John Moore's from Reading the Griffey stuff, and she was working out in Indonesia. And a couple of years ago, I got stuck in a tropical storm. I, 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 she, was, she still had some signal, I was so scared. She just, it was, she was literally in the building for three days, coming out, you know, trees and houses being put in mind. It was awful. Um, an extra tropical storm tracks to move polewood, the changes of wind, precipitation, the temperature patterns. So it's something that's global, okay? We're going to see changes in the uh, ocean circulation currents, THCs, etc. Um, our anthropogenic, our heavier blanket that we put on, that sort of sea level is going to continue for centuries because it's a lifetime. We can't stop it, it's going to carry on. Um, and there's going to be all kinds of climate changes and feedback mechanisms that come out of that. Even if we stabilise our greenhouse gas emissions in the next couple of years or 10 years. Even if we do that, this is still going to happen. This is a lifetime of centuries. It's too late in other words. We're, still, we're going to have to adapt. Business as usual is not an option. And there's a whole range of predictions about temperatures, etc. and whatever, but the bottom line is, Things like the Greenland ice sheet are melting, will melt, and if it all melts, we're talking about a seven, at an average, seven metre sea level rise average. Just have a think about that. This is why I bought a house on a sandstone ridge 
Didn't rain hell in St. Helens. It's the second highest point in Merseyside. <laughs> and I'm a coastal specialist. I wouldn't live on them. So there we go. Um, seven meters. That's going to impact here, not somewhere else. That's going to impact us here in this country. I'll come on to it later. We will see climate change refugees here. I take my students to pretend each other. We have a field centre in North Wales, past that in. And there's a little town on the Marlborough Estuary called Fairport. That's the first time this country has decided that will be abandoned. I take students to study and do research on it. So, um, that slide just says back of you, so that's a summary of that slide. We're going to see temperature changes. Um, um, even if we, even if we kept greenhouse gas emissions constant since the turn of the century, we would still see temperature increases. We're, we're committed to change in other ways. Even if we've done our best, we'd still be committed to change. It's a matter of reducing that change, mitigating it, and then adapting to it. That's our strategy. So. Let's move to a close as Tim Baker comes upon us. Let's think about people. You can see a map here of what this shows. I've got some little unclear to the podcast, but these are these are areas where there's vulnerability. So, I'm going to take the pair of areas exposed to hurricanes. Parts of the Indian continent. Uh, sorry, Europe, so Asia, Oceania. The, uh, the uh, Atlantic coast, the yellow areas exposed to desertification and drought, the Sahara Belt, Northern Africa, Southern Europe, the Middle East, swathes of Asia, South America, and North America. Coastlines under threat. You can't see the little bits of blue. And then islands are under threat, including our own area. I do a lot of, we do work on sand dunes so up in the Outer Hebrides. There's Orkney. I'm off to, I've been there, I'm off to Sheffield on holiday this year. They're under threat. Islands are under threat. I have students from the Maldives. Could be in the water. And we have to realise that when we see these type of things, it's usually the poor. Uh, are the ones that are impacted most heavily, and certainly the case for climate change events. Certainly the case for that. Um, so, by 2050, there are some projections that talk about 200 million climate change refugees. And just to be clear, that isn't just somewhere else. That's here as well. Not people coming in, some kind of weird Trump xenophobia thing coming up. These are people who are living here now. Climate change in Cambridgeshire, in the Fens, in North Wales, on the coast. These are people, includes people who are living, shown cheek by jowl with us now. Not the other, not the stranger, not someone else. Of course they're impacted, but people here as well. And some projections argue that, you know, we could, in the worst case scenario, if we don't get it right, if we don't respond to climate change, and then all those other threats spiral out of control, you know, it's not, it's maybe sensationalist, but you're not going to collapse a civilization. Right? Issues of, of war, peace, inequality, all get accentuated. Well, perhaps also we have to think, it's not just the climate change refugees and people who are moving, it's those who are immobile. It's those who haven't got the means to move. It's those people who are the, the really poor, who haven't got the means to move. And we saw this recently in New Orleans, with Hurricane Katrina. Those people with the means got out, jumped in the car, took the possessions, and left. The really poor, and it tended to be the poor black communities who were marginalised, they couldn't go. They stayed. They were the Emoma. So perhaps it's the Emoma that the ones are the biggest, biggest, uh, biggest threat, the ones left behind, the ones on the periphery, and that's what Pope Francis charged us with, isn't it? To be at work to the periphery in particular. So, 
We can see that these changes as all kinds of tipping points. Issues to do with agricultural productivity because of changes in climate. Water insecurity. Extreme weather. Collapse of ecosystems and implications for health. I can't go through all of these tea times or water bottles. I'll take the one. Health. And we can see a whole battery of issues to do with climate change and health. This is just one of the things. And then within that one thing, there's a whole myriad of things that we need to be aware of in terms of health. And if we just take one part of that, this is the complex or super complex challenge that we're faced in our lives, and it's a fact. Let's just take things like disease, malaria. And we can look at this. Mosquito borne disease. There's two projections an optimistic projection and a pessimistic projection. And even with the optimistic projection, it's worse. The pessimistic one is awful. But if you look at the optimistic scenarios in Western Europe and the Mediterranean Basin, we can still see that we're looking at mosquito borne diseases becoming prevalent in parts of Southern Europe and under pessimistic scenarios in 2030-2070. Well, look at this. This is not sensationalist. I'm not going to do it because we've got uncertainty. I'm you know, certain that we're uncertain. And there's a whole range of other tipping points I can't go into in the time allowed. Species extinction we've talked about, once you get to a certain level of speed and, and ecosystems collapse, it just suddenly hockey sticks, it gets much faster. Coral reef bleaching, because of the changes in the, in the chemistry of the water and the temperature, the changes in thermohaline circulation patterns, right? Uh, things get really worse. That affects northern hemispheres as well as southern hemispheres. And they're the rich places for biodiversity to be lost. Thermal haline circulation currents, the oceans of changes. There's all kinds of ocean regulatory issues to do with the climate there. There's all kinds of issues to do with food production. Oh, it's really, and again, it's a tipping point. So it gets to a point and it'll suddenly get worse. And then, of course, the Greenland ice sheets get to the point where it can suddenly get worse because things like the album, the, the reflectiveness of the, of the snow is barely get smaller. Therefore, it's this less reflective and therefore it'll melt faster. And it's one. Who's doing this? Who is the responsible for this? Well, we're all responsible, but some people need to take a lead. Emerging nations, industrial aid, people who are leaning heavily on fossil fuels, who are, who are wanting our lifestyles, the ones that we with, the privileged ones, us in the United States, the European Union the developed Western world, aspiring to our lifestyles. Do we lead a good life? <coughs> do we lead, I, I have to give you a seminar to the students, do we lead a good life? And yet people are aspiring to our life. So, <coughs> two times upon us, Changing attitudes and beliefs, this may be more underlying when I speak to my students, I say we can come up with all kinds of technical, technocratic approaches, locking up carbon, um, pepping in the sea with iron sulfide and things like that. Right. Coming up with electric cars, great. Right. But really what we need to do is change attitudes and beliefs and values. That's the underlying challenge. I've done that. That's the big challenge. So underlying, that's the big challenge for us, changing those attitudes and beliefs. And that's the really hard thing. Because some people just don't believe that any of this is true. And, and I have students on environmental courses who hold that position. Legitimately. Okay. And I've come up against Donald Trump in a book of inquiry. And his quote was, I am an environmentalist of the true type. And then I took the stand, being by QC and being cross examined. And they challenged me. And he said, you're not an environmentalist of the true type? I said, ah, environmentalist is a spectrum. He's a one end of the spectrum. And I'm not the other. <laughs> but even within 
environment works and climate change people. And even without that, there are people who disagree with the IPC predictions because they say they're too conservative, because they're safe ground, because they're about as politically palatable as they can be. There's plenty of environmental scientists who say, I accept that, but it's too conservative. We need to be looking at the way you look at different scenarios here. We can see guidance around how climate change represents one of the principal challenges facing humanity in our day. And contrast that with dear old Donny on Twitter, Donald Trump on Twitter. Give me clean, beautiful, and healthy air. Not the same old climate change, global warming, but it'll be better. So, mm -hmm. I am tired of hearing this nonsense. I've come up with a whole string of things. We have different attitudes. But what do the, what do the scientists say in the end of the round? Well, they agree that it's extremely likely that most of the observed increase in global average surface temperature, relatively more than it was, is caused by humans. And our hope, who's a scientist, reinforces that. Climate change is clear, the Catholic Church views climate change as a moral issue that must be addressed in order to protect the Earth and everyone. So, what's the take home messages? Take home messages. The challenge of avoiding catastrophic climate breakdown requires rapid, far-reaching, unprecedented changes, unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. That's the IPCC. But some people say that that's too conservative. And, and one of the press reports on the latest IPCC was, we've got 12 years to live with climate change, catastrophe, urgent actions needed. And we're nearly a year into that 12 years. So what do we need? Thinkers, not deniers. We have to face the reality, know that face the reality of change, business as normal is not an option. We have to adapt, we have to change. I said I'd return to the cinema, but there are not parallels there in our own church. There are real essential, unchangeable truths. And we have to adapt. And there are responses to those truths. So, a final slide. We need to take action. What a great group of people to come and speak to, Justice and Peace Group, and our own archdiocese. You're living in flames for this change. You're the ones who catalyze and fuse people. Fantastic. Take action. But I've said it's complex, it's super complex. Where do we start? What can we do? How can we really make a difference? Well, we can. So, how do you eat an elephant? Not that you should eat elephants, right? Well, you eat them bit by bit. Okay, and that's all you need to do. Take collective action. Cathod stands at the back there. Issues is with the cathod. Jed, there you are, of course. <laughs> cathod, stance on climate change. Fantastic. Take, take action. Join into things like that. Eat less meat. I'm not saying become a vegan or vegetarian here if you don't want to. But try and eat less meat. And try and particularly square beef. Because it just doesn't make sense. I hope we haven't got beef sandwiches for lunch. Okay. Insulate our buildings and homes. Switch to renewable energy wherever possible. There's great opportunities now. Walk, cycle wherever possible, maybe use public transport. Consider an electric car. There's electric car charging points now outside, and this place has just won a sustainability award. Fantastic. Reduce, recycle, reuse, buy fewer things, consume less, and vote whatever. Where they do, and we actually say this to my wife, who are the midwives and my students, whatever you do, just engage with the political system and put this on the agenda, whatever your political affiliations. Put it on the political agenda. Use your vote. 
And there's only one thing more powerful than any of this, and that's to pray. 